Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for coming. So um, this is the first time I do the talk this way with all the details because uh, when we discussed it that I will do an open lecture as well because initially 2015 when we started doing the open lectures was my idea based on my talks in different universities that this would be the best possible format to share an entrepreneurial story. And we thought about what should I talk about? It would be best to talk about why we actually do German tech. Um, so for me, um, to introduce you a little bit about myself, um, I'm born in Germany. Um, I'm born in 1981. This is how computers looked like back then. Um, for some of you who have been around and have seen it, uh, uh, it was exciting times. Um, I have two daughters, they are living in Sweden. So I commute between Stockholm uh, and Berlin. And I'm a huge soccer fan, so best club in the world. Um, <clears throat> could argue about that. Um, so when I was growing up in the 90s, it was the second most successful team in Germany after Bayern Munich. Speaking about growing up, um, when I grew up in the 90s, um, uh, 80s and 90s, my mother, um, <clears throat> she was working from home and uh, doing all different kind of things. And she had the idea uh, with a lot of other women uh, in our region um, to uh, create a cookbook. But not the idea was to create a cookbook. The idea is what skills do they have where they could make a business out of it to do good. And the idea was to collect money uh, for an orphaned home that they wanted to build in India because they knew a priest that was on an exchange in Germany. And um, the book turned out to be have a very funny story. So at this uh, very interesting uh, meeting and dinner, uh, where Gorbachev and uh, Helmut Kohl uh, were discussing reunification, uh, one of the guest presents that uh, Helmut Kohl gave to him uh, was that very cookbook. And um, <clears throat> this cookbook eventually led to raising 350,000 euros uh, to actually build the orphaned home and also um, giving uh, grants to the girls that lived in that orphaned home that are now studying, starting to work, because they all grew up um, uh, in these years. And this was something I, I witnessed at the time when I was a child, that something basic like this, all the recipes were handwritten, they put them all together in a book, and then they found a, a print shop that was able to uh, print all these edition, editions, uh, was, was quite inspiring. And talking about books, um, <clears throat> the, the last book that, um, that I read in my life uh, was uh, Bill Gates, um, The Way Forward. Um, funny story, I actually borrowed it from the Christian library in my hometown. I never returned it ever since. <clears throat> I looked at the stamp the other day, it still had a four digit zip code, so it's been a long time. Probably by the dues that I owe to the library, uh, we can build a new library. Um, but uh, th this was really inspiring because everything he wrote in the book, I thought if only parts of that is coming true, we're going to live in a completely different world. So I started to be a self-taught nerd. Um, I started uh, to code. Uh, I started to build computers. I tried to understand how computers work. I had no friends. I lived with my computer uh, every day and every night which ultimately led to the point that I dropped out of school when I was 17. Not because I planned to drop out of school, but I started already working as a freelancer when I was 15 for an advertising agency where I built uh, different websites and different uh, uh, CD-ROM production back in the days. So you had interactive productions for CD-ROMs um, because nobody else was able to do it. And I was lucky and fortunate enough that I had uh, friends, they were always older than me, and a good friend of mine asked me, hey, look, we have these clients in our agency. They want to do something like this. Don't you want to give it a try? So I tried, worked for that for two years, figured out how much money they charge their client for my work. So I eventually decided to do my, uh, do my own company. To give you a brief understanding how the internet looked like back then, uh, this is uh, uh, Yahoo in 1996. Um, <clears throat> and when I first seen the internet uh, and how it worked, 
Um, I became addicted ever since. So this was a modem at the time and all the wires. Uh, it was very difficult to set that up. I realized very fast um, what my strengths were and what I was really able to accomplish fast. So my strengths were really the design and the technology aspects uh, of creating uh, these kind of projects. I even at the school, when I was still at the school, run the part of the design class together with my teacher because my fellow students asked me if I could do so. And this was a, a very interesting uh, moment because the teacher who taught the course, he was actually coming from print. He had the opinion that internet is just a trend and it will go away. And all the students said like, no, we believe in something different and Benjamin is doing such a great job in doing this. Can't you just combine both? And he was really open then to do it. And I would say, in general, that and also my path through school is something quite unique. So I will come back to my elementary school in a, in a moment. Um, so I went to different kind of schools. And um, uh, this kind of behavior from teacher is obviously not very common. And also, when I dropped out of school, I had the great fortune that the um, uh, principal of the school told me when I had a meeting with him that I want to start or continue my business and I don't want to continue school. He said, look, school should prepare you for life and should not prevent you from life. So why don't you just try doing it? If it doesn't work out in a year or so, you come back and you finish school. So I think that was pretty advanced for considering German uh, school system. Um, <clears throat> I really like to do all this design stuff and all these um, uh, tech things, but I really figured out that I wanted to create something unique that nobody was doing at the time. And I ended up to create the very first website in Germany, which you would now in today's world call, call a unified messaging platform. So you were able to send free email, free SMS, and free fax messages. That was still a thing at the time. So. Um, <clears throat> I started doing that, um, and I was driven like this gentleman uh, by passion to develop this portal in 1997. Um, it was a very nerdy, again, way to do it because I needed a partner. I was living in a village with 4,000 people. There was no way I would find the right partners to do it. So I randomly emailed people that I found on the internet that I thought could provide any kind of infrastructure support to do it. And out of the 30-something people I wrote to, just one person responded. And I ended up doing it with exactly that, uh, that person. And none of these things that I ever done was ever about making the money, but really bringing this product to life. And this was something um, that always uh, drove me uh, in doing so. And um, we ended up to have an office. And our office, that's a basement, by the way. So the light that comes in is from the staircase that uh, goes up. Um, this was our office where we really started our first company. Two meters away from it, um, there was the bathroom. And in that bathroom, I had a field bed of the German military where I slept for the first six months until I was able to afford an apartment. Um, and uh, that bathroom luckily had a shower. So there was a shower, there was the office, and there was everything I needed. So this is how we started. This was a, um, an AG, an Inc., so a company that was designed to go public eventually, where our server farm that we used and run all of our operations back then looked like this. Why did it look like this? So back then, there were point of presence <coughs> called locations where you dialed up to with your modem that you had at home because it was cheaper to call that short distance. Um, and all of these small hubs, they had very fast internet. And this was one of the hubs. So we hijacked basically the hub um, for all the people that were dialing in, got very slow internet connection, but we were able to use it uh, for, our, uh, for our server infrastructure. So all of this was a lot of fun, but we then eventually thought about uh, that we have to make money or more money out of this. Um, at the time when we started, um, we had no idea, but when you have seen the office, we were already quite advanced in sense of, of the business because I will show you quickly 
how advertising revenue has grown in just a few months' time. So when we started, um, and I was still at school, with a few hours of work I put in, I made a couple of thousand euros a week, and that doubled like every week. And so we put in more and more work, uh, and eventually came to the point, what would happen if we put 24-7 into this? That what led eventually for me uh, to drop out of school. But to be able to get there, I think in retro perspectives, for me, it was really important um, to find a sweet spot and let go of everything around it and only focus on the things that, that really work. And how the company eventually uh, growed over time was pretty successful. We eventually started filing for an IPO. We wanted to take the, public, uh, the company public. We were not financed by venture capital, so we had an operational, profitable business. And this time looked like this. I mean, uh, everybody around me went public. People started big businesses. Um, there was just a time. Um, <clears throat> we were young and inexperienced. We wasted all the money that we made. Our interns got company cars. Uh, our CTO was able to buy new Sun server systems uh, for a huge amount of money every time he, he just needed. We were planning to buy an old farm and remodel it as a, as a tech hub. Uh, I was 19 at the time, got one of the first uh, Mercedes convertible AMG versions. Um, I didn't buy it, my co-founder bought it, to be uh, fair. So um, then a crazy time came along and the markets went down. What did it mean in our model of advertising? Well, within a really, really short period of time, all of the revenue vanished. And when I figured out that we losing money, I thought it's a technical problem. So I really digged into all of our IT infrastructure. We still had so many visitors on our websites. We didn't make any more money until we found out that all of our advertising clients were actually insolvent or couldn't pay more for advertising. So the whole market uh, went down. And one hard lesson learned at that point that money is not an unlimited resource. So this uh, was uh, a very early, early learning. Our IPO got canceled uh, four months uh, prior IPO. Um, and we put back all in our money that we earned uh, to try to turn around the company. Eventually, that didn't work out. So I moved back to my parents' place with no car, no money. And um, <clears throat> For a time, for a moment, I really felt lucky, and uh, uh, I survived the first internet bubble um, with no debts. I know many people that made a lot of money at the time that until today, for example, don't even get a credit card again because they just overspend all the money that they had uh, because everybody thought it's so insane and it will continue this way. Um, <clears throat> and. To conclude, for me, I did a real-life MBA in less than 24 months. It probably costed me the same amount of money an MBA costs you at a, uh, a business school. But um, <clears throat> to have everything from fast hiring, fast growth, to pre-IPO in real-life MBA uh, is something that still pays off for me uh, today. And I think there is just no perfect plan, and I just listened to my stomach and followed what I believed is the right way to do. And again here, this was the next situation because I just went into the next startup again. Um, <clears throat> this startup though uh, was the last company that raised significant venture capital. So we raised amount of 75 million euros. Uh, and mobile is king. This was like the next wave of technology after the internet went down, so if you went to an investor and told him about an internet idea, nobody would ever listen to, but internet in 2001 was the great new thing. Uh, the mobile internet and everything around mobile was the, was the next big thing. And I was there as director of operations, and in the time uh, I was there, we did six acquisitions uh, across Europe in different, uh, in different areas, 
And um, <clears throat> this company went public in, uh, in 2001, uh, 2004 uh, in Italy. I always call it an Italian IPO. So when we acquired uh, the company Vitaminic, uh, that company was public from the first wave of internet. Uh, there was no way to, get, to go to the stock market with a new company. So we were called Bongiorno Vitaminic for a year. We eliminated the name Vitaminic the year after, and in this way we brought the company public in, 20, uh, in 2004. I left the company in 2007, um, and during I was at Bongiorno, I started together with my father another business, which was uh, a solar distribution company. So uh, my father worked all his life in an energy company. He retired early, he was bored, we were discussing different opportunities. And in the early 2000s, solar business was, a, uh, was really a great opportunity. And um, before I go to the next slide, continue again my school story. I was the worst student in my elementary school. And guess who became my first client for the solar uh, industry business? My elementary school. Um, and uh, that's me, by the way, if you can't recognize me. Um, and this was a, it was a very interesting uh, journey because at the time when I was at the elementary school, I was the worst student in my class. And this was the last year where you had to follow your teacher's recommendation. So in fourth grade, I was the worst student. I had to go to a Hauptschule, which is the worst school in Germany that you basically can go to. Um, and after that, I did a really individual way through different schools uh, over time, but uh, I never studied. I have no uh, gymnasium degree until today. Um, and I was really happy to have as my first customer 10 years after I left the school, um, <clears throat> my elementary school. So back then, I also um, had a girlfriend, my later wife, and now my ex-wife, uh, living in Sweden. Um, and going back between Sweden and Germany, for me, was something, and this I just took a photo of a few weeks ago at a conference in Stockholm, time travel. So every time I got there, I've seen all these new technologies, all these startups, uh, all this innovation very much implemented. When we discussed 3G rollout in Germany, uh, you could buy flat rate uh, tariffs for your phone in Sweden that even worked in the subway. Who could tell that about Berlin until today? Nobody. So you had high speed internet on your phone on a flat rate in Sweden while we were discussing 3G rollouts. A lot of interesting startups came, came out of Sweden that you, even now with Spotify and in the past, uh, uh, Skype and many others. Um, and to give you an example where this ecosystem stands today, um, with, in a radius within 900 meters, you will find all the unicorns and it's six of them that are based out of Stockholm. So it's a very centered, very vibrant uh, tech ecosystem. And this was always really inspiring uh, for me and looking at the startups that were there that worked on really innovative stuff. Um, for me, from an investment point of view, looking to invest into startups, I always try to look at the things that were really innovative and really helped you to change a value chain or a complete market. Instead of expanding a value chain or just adding something new, maybe even adding completely new technologies to something that's already out there. In 2009, um, I, by total coincidence, started to lecture at this university. Um, at peak over the years to come, around 30 days a year. So I really felt committed to that because having never been at the university, I always thought innovation and entrepreneurship at German or European university must be amazing because we do all this amazing sh stuff, but it was actually really shitty. So I volunteered a lot of my time. Um, I recently uh, made an uh, estimate, uh, an analysis, sorry, about the students that partake only in that university. And for around 100 students, 27 of the students found until today 33 companies. Um, the business school average in Europe is 6%. So I think for that course that we set up uh, at the university, uh, it was quite a remarkable uh, number. And over the years, I really taught 
at a broad variety of universities in Europe and the US. And the actual reason why I kept doing that and did more about that was the Technical University Berlin, uh, because there I uh, had my very, very first talk at the university, and I was so disappointed about the interest of entrepreneurship in students, but then went to Zeppelin University, where the approach of the students was a complete different one. So this was what sparked the interest in me to create more interest about entrepreneurship at different, uh, different universities. And I also worked with a lot of different corporates um, uh, in, in different fields. Uh, I see one gentleman over there that, uh, that I met over there. And um, uh, to see how all the corporates work on innovation really frustrated my, uh, myself. And uh, I started um, also when I left the company to invest in a lot of different startups. And one very emotional story for me here um, is my longest portfolio investment. So this company just turned 10 years and they had their 10th anniversary. Um, they have now more than 100 employees and uh, they had the summer fest and they invited me. I was happy to be there because I'm like right now the smallest shareholder in the company and so long that I invested into and I went there with my two daughters in the summer um, and the opening speech of the two founders was like, uh, great that you're all here. One interesting story to share with you guys. We wouldn't be all here if Benjamin wouldn't have been the first one to invest into us 10 years ago. And this is the kind of relationship I really like with entrepreneurs to still even 10 years later have a very close relationship with the people that I, uh, that I invested into. And there are even people that I invested into twice. And this is a really funny aspect in terms of German psychology and how even German founders work. It's because when he left his first company and went to the founding team of the new company and they did the first angel round, I told him, like, why didn't you ask me if I want to invest too? He said, yeah, but you invested in the other and it didn't turn out so well. And I was like, yeah, but I'm sure that you won't do the same mistake twice, so I'm happy to invest another time. And uh, this is very common if you look into the US. Uh, for example, founders getting from the same investors two or three times uh, funding. I don't see it so much happening uh, over here because in venture capital, I think in Germany in particular, there's still a lot of you owe me culture when somebody invests into the company, whether to invest into something together. So over the last 12 years, I've been investing in over 30 companies um, across Europe. Um, more interesting, some companies I didn't invest into, so the anti-portfolio. Um, bottom line, most of these cases, for me personally, did not match the criteria that I told you before, that it's really something innovative from a technology standpoint, though these would have been decent investments. So um, it's always a, um, a significant trade-off. I also volunteered a lot of my time into different uh, accelerators and incubators across Europe. Uh, name one, and I probably could tell you which year I went there to mentor or to be part of a, a jury. And I also was a partner of a venture capital fund um, where I uh, was in charge of two of the investments uh, that, uh, that they eventually did in, in the Series A. But these two years in uh, the venture capital fund as a partner, looked for me much more like this than like this, and I like this. So th this guy, the founder of, uh, of Under Armour, uh, he also made a very cool post the other week in LinkedIn, uh, which I recommend you to find and, and read it. Uh, he said in the beginning he always had two business cards. One was like head of sales and one was the CEO. If you talk to investors, he pulled out the CEO. If you talk to customers, uh, he had the sales card because he always said, okay, you want these terms, I have to go back and talk to the CEO. So, uh, smart guy, uh, and I like to work with, work with smart guys. All of what you just heard and have seen, the lecturing, the working with corporates, um, uh, the work with corporates, the lecturing at universities, the investment in startups, the founding of my business myself, all of the lessons learned, the do's and don'ts, a lot of the don'ts, I always put in a mind map. And this mind map in 2014, I used then to create the concept of 
what today is German tech. Um, and the idea was, or why I actually then went on to do something about it, was in 2014, there was a study amongst German students. What is the most entrepreneurial university in Germany? And Zeppelin University was placed number one. And everybody came to me that this is a great accomplishment. And I said, no, it's shit, because it's a hobby of myself and everyone else that, uh, that's involved. How great could be a place where we pull together a smart team of people, maybe not at Lake Constance, but maybe in Berlin, where we could make this happen. And um, this was the initial moment uh, of writing back then the concept paper of the Berlin Center of Entrepreneurship, um, which then later became the German Tech Entrepreneurship Center, which now is only German Tech. Um, and the idea there was to bring together the Berlin-based universities, corporates, startups, uh, and experienced founders, because the corporates, the startups, and the universities speak different languages, and we need to create a place where we bring them all together. And funny enough, four years forward, uh, we work with a lot of international universities, rarely with Berlin-based universities, uh, which has a completely different reason, but being in this position to bridge between these worlds, we can accelerate a lot more innovation to, to happen in the, uh, in the market. And to the opening in 2015, from 2014, it was nine months, and it was nine intense months. So I went out to do fundraising. Um, I went out to speak to corporates, foundations, entrepreneurs, tell them we want to create this place. There is no business model. Uh, we just need to have this place. I already invested some money into it. Uh, let's do this. And it took us nine months to raise approximately one million euros. One of our first open lecture speakers <coughs> that we then had was Ken Morse. He was the founder of the MIT Entrepreneurship Center. And after his open lecture, I went with him for dinner and asked him, Ken, how did you raise the money for the MIT Entrepreneurship Center? And he was like, yeah, uh, I went on a roadshow for a couple of weeks, and then we had 23 million euros, and then we started the MIT Entrepreneurship Center. So I think there's a fundamental different mentality in Germany and Europe when it's about giving back and helping the next generation of people. Because I even asked him, so, was there one large donator or contributor to this. No, 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 this was just individuals. They all contributed more or less the same. So it's a very broad base um, of people that were involved. And this is also something going forward we want to change, and I will tell a little bit about this later. So we started January, uh, July 1st, 2015. We had this great uh, uh, opening day. Um, usually in Berlin, you have a no-show rate of 50% or more, as you can see today. Um, but here we had 350 signups and over the day we had more than 700 people coming uh, because people were telling each other what's happening there and uh, what stuff is going on with all kinds of, and we talked 2015, right? Uh, things like Tesla and electrical bikes that you can test ride. Uh, we had different workshops uh, in the space. And this workshop space, uh, as you can see, looks very trashy because it was, so this used to be the administration office uh, of the GDR, and it was not used until we moved in, in 2015. Uh, we did some minor renovation, took out some walls, and used it as it is, chairs where uh, paper boxes, where we put uh, some pillows on it, um, and where we also started to do our open lecture series here with Holger Weiss, who was our first uh, open lecture speaker. So over the last four years, um, we had quite a journey. We were one of the first supporters uh, of uh, uh, Ready School. Um, this was uh, in our space. Um, there's a funny story about the wall that you see here. When we started to remove the walls, behind one wall we found cutouts from Western music magazines from the 70s that were hiding, the construction people were hiding them behind the wall in the future administration office for the GDR. Um, so we kept that. Um, and also in that, in that summer 2015, when all the refugees came uh, uh, to Europe, um, we pulled together a couple of initiatives. Uh, and one I wanted to show, because 
Um, this was mainly driven by entrepreneurs in our network. Uh, overnight, we managed to get a company that does food delivery um, and enough entrepreneurs to bring in money that for around 1,000 people, we were able to provide ice cream and water at a day where there was 35-ish degrees and people were living for days under the trees, had nothing to drink and nothing to eat. They went there to distribute it. <coughs> and all of this was put together by entrepreneurs, primarily in Berlin-based, within, uh, within one day. And I found that quite inspiring, as well as uh, what Anna did with the Ready School. Um, and this also sparked more of our awareness um, in terms of the social responsibilities uh, that all the entrepreneurs entrepreneurs have. So what keeps me up at night since was how can we actually scale this kind of impact um, that we have. And with German Tech, the idea was always to create something that helps society. And um, as a business model of German Tech, I always describe to people, it's a modern day Robin Hood. We work hard with those who have it to give it to those in need. And this Ultimately, we put in a thank you uh, in a setup where we have two operational companies um, that can either work with governments, with foundations, uh, with CSR departments, or with corporates um, on the digital change, the transformation, new technologies, and all of that being owned uh, by the uh, by the foundation. In this way, uh, we can show that we have a business model and we ultimately give back with this to, to society because we have been working a lot with social entrepreneurs and the biggest challenge for them always has been, I also need to have a business model or to make them aware of that they also need to have a business model. Um, it scales much faster if you do so. so um, this was the idea, this is what we have started and what we implemented uh, now. And um, since we started, we have been working with a variety of foundations and, uh, and corporates since 20, uh, 2015. And um, it's so broad in scope um, from different trainings, from teaching social entrepreneurs, but also to work with corporates on the digital change, training their employees, getting them to be able to start new ventures and businesses uh, within, those, uh, within those organizations. That this has been so far for me the biggest surprise that with the little effort compared to large consultancies, we could reach so much impact. Because the key driver of our initiatives is not that we send in consultants, we send in entrepreneurs. And we work with around 300 entrepreneurs uh, in Europe, and they are the experts that actually manage those kind of programs. In this way, we can stay very lean and small as an organization, though still compete in some of the corporate programs with the large consultancies uh, and the likes, um, and find more and more interest uh, by large corporations to work with somebody like us instead of the traditional consultancies because also from a business model perspective, I think we have a very high uh, alignment with the interest of our partners. Instead of charging more days, we're trying to work on results. So this is where we, uh, where we stand uh, so far and this has been kind of the story to get to where we are today. Um, for me, I think uh, I like this quote very much of Nicholas Berggren because uh, we only have this moment and we have to create something that is meaningful, that pays forward the change and the society to evolve to a new model, to new ways of doing things. I think in the next years to come, we have to question almost everything that is, that is there and to detach ourselves a little bit from all of this, but still having the principles of a free market and democracy and business in mind, I think both can go with each other. I think for too long, 
it has been separated in social entrepreneurs and for-profit entrepreneurs. I always call like the social entrepreneur and Adam Newman. So like these are two worlds and like there would be nothing in between. And I think that's not true. I believe that so many entrepreneurs out there are in between and could help. And best possible, I think what Barack Obama said at the Bits and Brezels conference sums this up. I don't think that doing well and doing good should be a difference. I think both should be able to, to combine. And this is what we want to push forward in, uh, in society with the, with the whole idea how we operate uh, with, with our business. And with that, I would like to say thank you and would like to open the round for questions. Thanks. <laughs>